I'm back with another video. Today we have Pythagoras and his weird religious cult. It's on both screens. Without further ado, let's get straight into the video. Out of all the great ancient Greek philosophers, there are a few that are more household names than others. Figures like Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates. And on that list is probably also the mysterious Pythagoras. We've all heard his name, hell, we all had to learn that theorem in school when we grew up, but what do we actually know about Pythagoras? When I say the name Pythagoras, what comes to mind? Perhaps uh, scientist, ancient Greek philosopher, perhaps mathematics and geometry, an ancient proto-scientist interested in the ways that reality is built on mathematics and geometry? Pretty likely. But how about cult leader, shaman, and hater of beans? Probably not words that you associate with Pythagoras, but words that might not be too far off from the truth, and maybe even more close to the truth than those concepts that we usually associate with his name. So let's dive into the world of ancient Greece and explore the fascinating life and movement of Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans. Eve to me is basically freedom. It's a giant open hey, universe blocker. where you Pythagoras is a so-called pre-Socratic philosopher. This means that he is a figure that lived before Socrates, and this speaks to the importance of the latter figure more than anything else. It is generally believed that Pythagoras lived between the 6th to 5th centuries BC, and is thus one of the earliest figures of his kind that we know of. Now, there are a lot of legends surrounding Pythagoras. In later periods, he came to represent the originator of some of the most fundamental philosophical ideas and currents that were believed to be carried on by figures like Plato and many others. He is sometimes even called the first philosopher and holds a very high status and role in the Western philosophical tradition. There is thus a tendency to project later ideas and developments backwards onto Pythagoras, but can we somehow remove all these myths and get an idea of who the real historical Pythagoras was? Possibly, but not without some struggle. The later self-proclaimed followers of Pythagoras, the so-called Pythagoreans, came to make up a distinct group in antiquity and were characterized by specific ideas and a particular Pythagorean way of life aspects of which might be traceable to the man himself. But as the intro suggested, it might not be what you expect. So who was he then? Well, as I'm sure you're used to hearing by this point, the sources really aren't on our side. Pythagoras himself never wrote anything, he wrote no texts, no books, and most accounts of his life often come centuries after he died. Did he even exist? Probably, but it can be difficult to tell legend from historical truth. In general, some of the later sources that describe his life and teachings may indeed, of course, have their source in earlier traditions, and the existence of a somewhat continuous quote-unquote Pythagorean way of life, followed by people at the time, can be helpful in tracing these traditions back to his own time. Especially useful for us are the so-called akousmata, sayings attributed to Pythagoras himself, which sometimes include direct references to the way of life that he is said to have taught. The most complete account of his life come in the 3rd and 4th centuries CE, or AD. We have two works entitled The Life of Pythagoras from this time, one by Diogenes Laertius and another by Porphyry. We also have a work called On the Pythagorean Life by the famous Neoplatonist Iamblichus. These are all written 800 years after Pythagoras supposedly lived and don't exactly strive for historical objectivity, but there are aspects of them that can be used. We also have more fragmentary mentions earlier on in writings by people like Aristotle and even earlier figures that are more trustworthy for that reason, but these accounts are not as complete. So with this in mind, what do we got? Pythagoras was born and grew up on the island of Samos. Basically nothing at all is known about his early life, but some claim that he would have traveled a lot to places like Babylon and especially Egypt to learn the so-called wisdoms of the Egyptians. 
Indeed, Pythagoras is especially associated with Egyptian wisdoms, and some of his ideas claim to have come from that land originally. Now we should. <sighs> yep. Most of it does. I mean, we got a lot of pyramids here in America, and before America was Tyre Mary and the Grand Canyon and all kind of things that's blocked off for a great reason. But, um, yeah, the ancient mystery schools of ancient Kemet, which you know today of as Egypt. That's where all this stuff come from. Shadow work, light magic, white magic, dark magic, voodoo, hoodoo. It's all still from the ancient mystery schools of Kemet. Or It's like a lot of people take these things and what they learn and then they present it and you think it come from them. And it doesn't. Yeah, the ancient mystery schools of Kemet. And anyone couldn't just go there. They have to see something in you that you worthy of having such knowledge. They have to see something in you. They have to see something in you to trust that you can. As it should be, though. All information, esoteric knowledge, and hit in the, in the cult knowledge should not be solicited to the populace. It should not. And I'm not the one to tell you what you deserve. All I can do is simply tell you what you deserve from me. If I'm an ascended master acquired the philosopher's stone, I wouldn't even share it with my own mother. She gossip and talk too goddamn much, and she's going to spill her beans to... And most people ain't worthy of that. We see it. This construct is up, and this construct reflects... Mirrors a reflection. And that's what we see, the things that we don't like. From skier row, homelessness, the migrants got things going on that you never got you've been here even your veterans more than 800,000 kids gonna miss it annually in the United States alone we all got loved ones that had legs amputation died of health complications due to this FDA approved standardized American diet poison so it shows it's not the matter of me as a collective the populace isn't worthy of such knowledge it's a cult it's hidden for a reason it should only be disclosed to once that can truly be trusted with it so now let's continue we should keep in mind that this was a very common trope back then and it shouldn't necessarily be taken as entirely true in any case at some point when he was around 40 years old he moved to the greek city of croton in southern italy and it is here that he really enters history at least i know this is sad from the video but let me know what y'all think y'all think those are masks the um the, the Egyptian gods had on. I ain't, they look like me. They my same tone and everything, but they, I'm thinking they got on masks. I ain't, I'm thinking they got on masks. <laughs> I think they got on masks. An uh, Ivis here with a human body. Not to say it isn't or whatever, but I, I, I think they. I think it's a mask. I think it's a mask. It's probably a double entendre. It's probably a... And it's probably, probably metaphorical, so... He's relatively. He starts gathering followers and espousing his teachings and way of life. Indeed, by all accounts, Pythagoras became quite famous during his own lifetime as a kind of sage. His fame sage. didn't come from some mathematical theories or quote-unquote philosophy in the regular sense of that word, but rather as a kind of wonder-working sage who could perform amazing superhuman feats and who led a group of followers that followed a certain Pythagorean way of life, which included rituals and rules that seemed, and still kind of seem, pretty weird. The view of Pythagoras as a kind of magical being is found all over the sources. Aristotle retells a few stories, quotes, The son of Nicomachus, in other words Aristotle, Nicomachus. adds that Pythagoras was once seen by many people on the same day and at the same hour, both at Metapontum and at Croton. And at Olympia, during the games, he got up in the theater and showed that one of his thighs was golden, which was a sign of divinity. The same writer says that while crossing the Cosas, he was hailed by the river, and that many people heard him so hailed. It is also told that Pythagoras supposedly killed a deadly biting serpent by biting it himself, which is incredibly badass, and a bunch of similar stories. 
In other words, the reputation that Pythagoras had at the time, according to many people, was not as some scientific philosopher, that word didn't really even exist at that point, but rather as a kind of semi-divine being who had very significant psychic and spiritual powers. I used the word shaman in the intro, and that word should rarely be employed, and it doesn't really work here either, but you can kind of see why some people have gravitated towards calling him a shaman. He had secret wisdoms and performed practices exactly. that allowed him to be in multiple places at the same time. Perhaps his soul could travel to different realms and other such juicy things. And that point about the soul is very important because it actually segues nicely into the actual teachings that he is associated with. Indeed, Pythagoras seems to have taught that the soul is distinct from the body, that it is immortal and survives after the body's death. This was a quite unusual teaching at the time, but would be picked up by many in the future, including of course Plato. This is one of those things that he might indeed have gotten from the Egyptians, who indeed did believe in a post-mortem life for the soul, or souls sometimes. After the body dies, the immortal soul is then reborn into another body. That's right, Pythagoras most likely taught the theory of reincarnation. This is perhaps most colorfully indicated in a story that appears in both Xenophanes and Diogenes Laertius' life of Pythagoras. Quote, Once they said that he was passing by when a puppy was being whipped, and he took pity and said, Stop, do not beat it, for it is the soul of a friend that I recognized when I heard it screaming. In this somewhat comical but telling story, Pythagoras recognizes that it is the soul of an old friend that has reincarnated as this particular dog. We don't know much at all about the details of Pythagoras' theory of reincarnation. In other spots, it seems like he imagines the soul to be subject to a kind of divine judgment after death, where it can be punished in the underworld. I'm sorry, I gotta take my time and look at this. Every time I see I can't help but to actually look at it and analyze it. It's nothing like it. It's no culture like it that even comes close. At all, like. It's the reason for everything you see. Down to them being barefoot, staying grounded. And didn't wear much clothes, and I would assume the, f the fabric would be something that doesn't block the current, the electricity, the, the magnetism. Because you know some fabrics is throw off your... <sighs> like the, even this language. It's crazy to think and know. Everybody across the planet, every sect and group of people have their own language except for so-called african-americans i wonder why yeah, you should know this before english the mean is of these things let's continue world or have a more pleasant afterlife Crazy. maybe this is connected somehow to the nature of reincarnation but we simply don't know what is clear is that Pythagoras was seen as an expert on the nature of the soul and its fate after death. We're beginning to get a new idea of who this guy was, or at least claimed to be, a person who knew a thing or two about the soul and could perhaps even manipulate his own soul to do really cool tricks. And so it isn't perhaps that surprising that he made quite a name for himself and that he managed to gather a devoted group of followers in Croton. These first Quote Pythagoreans that. would have been like a little secret society gathering around their teachers to learn esoteric teachings and practices, and they were especially characterized, as I've alluded to already, by following a certain Pythagorean way of life. This was in fact what Pythagoras and his followers were mostly famous for, having a specific set of rules and ritual conducts that made them stand out. And here, the akousmata, or supposed sayings Akuzmata. of the man himself, becomes especially important. It's not certain just how much of this is true, but it certainly paints a picture. First of all, it seems that Pythagoras was vegetarian, and that his way of life included following a vegetarian diet. This was perhaps connected to the idea of reincarnation, as these two tend to be connected sometimes. Apart from this, a lot of the rules that the Pythagoreans followed were connected to religious ritual. Rules of conduct that were to be followed in the temples, for example. That makes sense. They always say you are what you eat. Some people take that as, 
But literally, they just start laughing about it. No, it's not a joke. It's a real thing. The energy of whatever you consume. Whether if it was a, a scare animal and it released this adrenaline or whatever, this fear right before it died and you consume that. Or you can think you eat in holistic as well, but you cooking it past whatever temperature and you 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 killing the you cooked it past the appropriate temperature and you now killed it. So now it don't have its nutrients and what it's supposed to have. You're supposed to eat it raw and but yeah, you're supposed to eat according to your genetic makeup for you to be healthy. Cause if you got nothing but water that isn't fluoridated and all that, you got all your minerals you're supposed to have, and you eat according to your genetic makeup, and you ain't gonna have foggy, you know, when your thoughts is foggy sometimes and you can't think, you can't recollect, you ain't as sharp, but that's the reason why the government is against us. It's the reason why they attack law. Law is land, air, and water. It's the reason why it's chemtrails, metals, barium, particulates in the air that you breathe in and it seeps through your pores on the largest organ on your body being your skin. And then the water is fluoridated. And that's one of the main ingredients to killing the red. And it's not good for your teeth. And some of you still proceed to say they conducted a study. You got to follow the money and see who paid for them to conduct the study. They in the same bracket. Like, it's bad for you. It's t that's an understatement. Calcify your pineal gland. So you got to think, just look at these days of what you got. Hold on, what was the other one? Okay. Um, the air, chemtrails, the water, and then the GMOs, genetically modified organisms, the food, preservatives, red 40, and all kind of, we are not even supposed to be eating that sugar, that man-made sugar. So you chemically imbalanced. You can't, you, you the potential all the way up here, and you just, you can't, gra you can't grasp it. You can't grab it. You can't grasp it at all. Like, you chemically imbalanced. You can't even think how you're supposed to think. You're supposed to be innovative, creative, a free thinker. Nobody can't trick you or use trickology on you. You can discern well. Like, you're supposed to. That's the reason why they attack land, air, and water. And got you worried about the land you own that you will never own. And then they indoctrinate you, not educate you. Well, yeah, it makes sense. He was able to reach these feats and do these things. He went to the ancient mystery schools of Kemet. And I'm pretty sure this was enforced on them. People chemically molesting and chemically castrating you through your food and it's having residual effects. So, of course, you're supposed to be able to do great things, but you, you can't. You bombarded with too many distractions. Your light is dwindled due to generations. Generations. And now it's you that come about and you think you know what you know already. And you got limiters and you got limiters on your brain. If you can't break those barriers, you can't do things that defies explanation. It's crazy. Well, let's continue. Pythagoras didn't form a new religion of his own. They followed the established Greek religion at the time, but formulated particular rules surrounding these religious rites. For example, one wasn't allowed to enter the temple barefoot. You had to, quote, pour libations to the gods from the ear or handle of the cup. You couldn't wear images of the gods on your finger, and you couldn't sacrifice a white cock. Fair enough, you might think, but there is more, and it gets weirder. The Pythagoreans weren't allowed to bury their dead in wool. You had to put on the right shoe first, before the left foot. You weren't supposed to travel on public roads, and perhaps the strangers of them all, you were absolutely not allowed to eat beans. Beans were no good at all. Are you having trouble trying to keep up with your professor? You've got to try Otter. Here's how it works. Having trouble from an account from the life of screen. Pythagoras, we learn about this bean hate as well as some of the other rules. Quote, beans. Pythagoreans enjoined abstention from beans either because they are like the privy parts or because they are like the gates of Hades, for this is the only plant that has no joints, or because they are destructive, unclear what that means, or because they are like the nature of the universe, also highly unclear, or because they are oligarchical, being used in the choice of rulers by lot. Things that fall from the table they were told not to pick up, to accustom them to eating with moderation, or because such things mark the death of someone. They must not touch a white cock, because this animal is sacred to the month and is a suppliant, and supplication is a good thing. They must not break the loaf, nor must they divide the loaf which brings them together. Others explain the rule by reference to the judgment in Hades, others explain that it is from the loaf that the universe starts. 
Other than these specific rules, the Pythagoreans were expected to live a somewhat austere and contemplative life. Quote, step not over a balance, in other words, be not covetous. Poke not the fire with a sword, in other words, do not vex with sharp words a man swollen with anger. Pluck not the crown, in other words, offend not against the laws, which are the crowns of cities. Or again, eat not heart, i.e. vex not yourself with grief. Sit not on the corn ration, i.e. live not in idleness. When on a journey, turn not back. In other words, when you are dying, cling not to this life. If some of you know a thing or two about the ancient world, you might already be thinking what I'm about to say. A lot of this reminds us of the so-called mystery cult that existed in antiquity in the Hellenic world particularly. Indeed, many have compared and connected Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans to the so-called Orphix, another ancient mystery cult centered around the mythical figure of Orpheus. These two groups share a lot of features, and it wouldn't be too far off to call the Pythagoreans a kind of mystery cult. Kirk, Raven, and Schofield describe the Orphic cult as such, quote, we can safely say that the name of Orpheus was associated from at least the 5th century on with the institution of various rites, which included initiation into mysteries depicting terrors of Hades, and whose object was to produce a happy state for initiates before and after death. Much the same can probably be said for the Pythagoreans. They were a group based on secret initiation, and which probably included special rituals and practices alongside a general ascetic way of life and the rules mentioned above to help the initiate purify his soul in some way in hopes of a better afterlife or perhaps better reincarnation. There's a great aura of esotericism over Pythagoras in general. There's a lot we don't know about what went on in the group and what their teacher actually taught, and this is partially on purpose. In fact, another thing that the Pythagoreans became famous for was their practice of silence, both in a literal sense of just being silent and not talking. Some sources claim that a person who wanted to become a Pythagorean had to observe a five-year silence. But secondly, this silence also includes a less literal way of simply keeping their mouth shut about the secrets of their master's teachings. There seems to have been certain esoteric aspects to Pythagoras' ideas that his followers weren't allowed to disclose to the uninitiated. It's the kind of stuff that we both love and hate to see. Understandably, perhaps, this colorful little group attracted quite a lot of attention at the time, but not all of it was positive. Indeed, it is said that the group came under attack at some point in the last years of the 6th century BC, even to the point of violence, which forced Pythagoras to relocate to another Greek city in Italy called Metapontum, where he's thought to have died somewhere around 490 BC. Now, you might be saying to yourself, hold on, that's it? There was nothing about mathematics or geometry or any of the things that we associate with Pythagoras. Fair point, and this is actually a very difficult topic. It is indeed true that the name Pythagoras is primarily associated with philosophy that involves numbers and their relationship and importance in reality and in the world. And when anyone talks about later philosophers, you know, as soon as they say as soon as they say anything about numbers, like Plato talking about the one or the dyad, as soon as numbers come into the picture, people tend to say, oh that's Pythagorean. And a lot of the time these philosophers would say the same. Plato himself was often seen by his later followers as following a Pythagorean tradition of wisdom. But are these ideas actually Pythagorean as in originating in the thought of Pythagoras himself? There is very little in the direct sources about his life that suggests that he had any such ideas, but that doesn't mean that they aren't there at all. We should be careful not to apply later ideas backward, and indeed a lot of ideas that later thinkers identified as Pythagorean were actually Platonist and anachronistically projected backwards to Pythagoras to legitimize them, but at the same time, it is very possible that he did have ideas about the fundamental role of numbers in the cosmos. Indeed, his movement did survive after he died, after all. Sometime in association with this, it is often thought that the movement was divided into two general camps, the Akusmatikoi, which focused on the religious rules and rituals that had characterized the movement outwardly, and the Mathematikoi, who instead appears to have focused on what we would refer to as more, quote, philosophical questions, especially including, and here's the kicker, mathematics. Even if this version of events isn't based entirely on historical fact, it's hard to say. Indeed, in the fourth century, just a little bit later, we have many people, and in this period we of course have a lot more contemporary sources that 
refer to these people, we have people who self-identify as Pythagorean and whose philosophy and whose teachings resemble a lot more what we would associate with that name. Figures like Philolaus argue that reality was based on the concept of the unlimited and limit, and on the harmony between the two, making numbers essential to understanding the cosmos. And Archytas made significant innovations to mathematics and geometry, both being Pythagoreans. Indeed, the later Pythagoreans of the 4th century and after its resurgence a while later, came to be associated not only with that characteristic way of life, sometimes not at all, but with mystical and philosophical ideas surrounding numbers, stuff like numerology, geometry, arithmetic, and music theory. In the most general sense, Pythagoreans believed that reality was somehow made up of numbers, and this expresses itself in a multitude of ways. Geometry is, of course, intimately connected with numbers and math, and the Pythagoreans developed geometric theories that also seemingly explain the inner workings of the cosmos. Especially in works by people like Philolaus, who talk about the unlimited and limits, harmony becomes important in Pythagoreanism. Mathematical and geometric ratios and harmony are key to their philosophy, and this also directly connects it to music, which is another subject with which Pythagoreanism is strongly associated. The Pythagoreans develop significant theories around music theory and are key to the understanding of harmonic ratios in music, for example determining the fourth, fifth, and octave in a scale. The harmony between musical notes and chords is all based on mathematical ratios that correspond to auditory experience. And lastly, Pythagoreanism is also associated with a certain cosmology, involving the revolution of the planetary spheres as a part of this mathematical harmonious universe. Indeed, the already mentioned Philolaus may have been one of the first to suggest that the Earth was not in the center of the universe, and some even claim that he affirmed the heliocentric model, based on his claim that the Earth revolves around a, quote, great fire, but this is, of course, interpretation. To connect it all again, the Pythagoreans would hold to a theory of the so-called music of the spheres, that the heavenly bodies, as they revolve and move across the sky and their spheres, create harmonious music. So all of it is connected to the mathematical and geometric ideas surrounding harmony. Is it possible then that these ideas, at least some of them, originate with Pythagoras himself? Sure. In fact, I think it would be a little weird that so many who claim to follow the teachings of Pythagoras in later centuries simply took those ideas completely out of thin air, so to say. It is quite possible that underneath the ascetic ways of life and the ritual rules, Pythagoras had more esoteric, secret teachings involving numbers and harmony. Some later followers may have chosen to follow only the ritualistic and practical aspects of his thought, perhaps the so-called akusmatikoi, while others brought into light the more speculative philosophical teachings, the so-called mathematikoi, perhaps. But it is a difficult topic to wrap your head around. Indeed, sometime in the 4th century, the Pythagoreans essentially disappeared. It is only a few centuries later, in the last years before the turn of the Common Era, that we see a resurgence of what is known as Neo-Pythagoreanism. And this isn't necessarily a school of thought per se, but a loose group of individuals who all held Pythagoras as a central figure in the history of philosophy, perhaps even as the first philosopher. It is these so-called Neo-Pythagoreans that might have originated some of the ideas that we most associate with Pythagoreanism more generally, and which traces all later wisdom, such as the ideas of Plato for example, back to the figure of Pythagoras. The Neo-Pythagoreans were often heavily influenced by Platonism in fact, and later played an important part in the development of so-called Neo-Platonism. But even aside from these philosophical ideas, the legacy of Pythagoras continued to be carried forward in, in different ways. Even in late antiquity, there are people who are associated with Pythagoras or associated with Pythagoreanism simply based on their behaviors and conduct, perhaps connected to that so-called Pythagorean way of life that he was so strongly associated with. These Pythagoreans were so identified because they, for example, were vegetarians, that they wore very simple clothing, had unkept hair and beard, something that was very unusual in Roman times especially, and that they kind of smelled bad. So basically they were kind of like the hippies of antiquity. In other words, the legacy of the wonder-working sage was carried forward in many different and diverse ways even many, many centuries after he died. So Pythagoras... How are you going to be a philosopher that stink? 
That's crazy. This is an enigma in more ways than one. To me, he's one of the most interesting f characters, one of the most interesting figures in the whole tradition of ancient Greek philosophy and religion. There are perhaps many different sides to his life and thought, sides that were carried forward by different groups of his followers in later centuries. Most of us might have heard his name many times and been taught that theorem in school, which probably wasn't his to begin with, but few of us have delved into the mysterious, wonder-working, semi-divine sage side of him that is so fascinating. But that's why I'm here, to provide you with esoteric and strange goodies to help you sleep at night. For now, I hope you've learned something new about Pythagoras and his weird religious cult. We should definitely spend more episodes in the future talking about those mathematical uh, ideas that his later followers were associated with, something that I only had time to touch on very briefly in this episode. It does indeed provide some of the most interesting and foundational ideas in the history of philosophy and mysticism. So as you contemplate that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 10, don't forget to leave a comment and like the video if you feel like it deserved. Well, that's it for this video. Don't forget to like the video if you like the video. I like it. Comment, share, subscribe, turn on post notifications, DM me the link via X, formerly known as Twitter. Let me know what you want me to react to next or what you want me to talk about. Follow me on Twitch, Kick, and Rumble. You can't tell me aliens ain't great, though. You get in, you in the ancient mystery schools of Kemet. You probably got Thope in there with his Ibis mask on, like. I can't trust you. You smell like that. You inconsiderate of self. You inconsiderate of nature. You inconsiderate of the animals. You inconsiderate of the other people. To be walking around or walking this ease. The aliens is amongst us. Us versus them. I'll see y'all in the next video. I'm out.